Well, good morning. And thank you, Jam, for the, the kind introduction. I, I want to, is this on? Are we good? Um, uh, th thank Jim for his service to, to your area. Uh, his his uh, political career kind of matched mine that, that decade in, uh, in the 90s, uh, early to, or yeah, in the end of the 90s. And uh, you represent this area very, very well. You're the champion for manufacturing, champion for all what is right and good. And Jim, great job. Uh, we have Representative Kuntz, who's here tonight. Thank you for your, he's a great leader and, and he is a fighter. He sits on the uh, Labor Committee, which is a very contentious committee, and as he uh, said this morning, I've, I've known this, he's the only guy on the nine-member committee, ten-member committee, that has actually signed the front side of a paycheck, and that's pretty remarkable for a, a Labor Committee. Um, but anyway, he, he's the guy who picks fights on the Labor Committee. He's the guy you ought to keep, keep electing in this area. And I also want to recognize uh, my good friend Bill. Bill has served on our, uh, our board. He was a chair of our board. Uh, Bill Henderson, thank you very much for your service to the MMA. Um, so what I'm going to do today, I'm going to talk a little bit about MMA. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, manufacturing. Then I'm going to talk about the legislature and the threat, some threats and opportunities. Then guess what? This is election day. We're going to talk some politics. We're going we're to make some predictions and we're going to wager. We're each going to lay down a dollar and we're going to wager on who wins it. Um, first, let me start out. Um, kind of showing my staff. Um, we have three lobbyists at MMA, two people dedicated to uh, talent and uh, a government or a, our grassroots person. So let me just point to him that that's me. Uh, Bill Rail is our executive director of, of Workforce Solutions. Uh, we pulled him out of the Jackson Area Manufacturers Association. He is the best talent guy in the state, and we call him Zeus because we pulled him down from Mount Olympus. We're so proud to have him. And we recently pulled down uh, Laura, Laura Preuss from uh, Dwice Manufacturing. Uh, she was famous for having created Dwice University, uh, a training system within a manufacturer, and just did, has done great. She's been here a little less than a year, but we're very proud to have her. Uh, Dave Wortham's our, our director of employment policy, uh, fights, you know, works with uh, Representative Kuntz on, on labor policy, and uh, Mike Witowski, uh, we just uh, hired out, out, of, uh, out of the Senate, the chief of staff to Senator Victory, and he runs our uh, he's director of our environmental and regulatory affairs. Jacob Duberville is our grassroots guy, and uh, Cindy Grostick is our coordinator who kind of keeps us all on track. Um, so let me talk a little bit about MMA. So MMA has been around for 122 years, started in 1902. Um, and we represent, like there's a lot of associations in town, in Lansing. We represent, and the only organization that represents manufacturers in the interest of manufacturing. Um, and, and that's significant. I know we have manufacturers in the room. We represent you. Other organizations have to represent a lot of different, not to be critical of any, any other organization. You are our singular focus, and I think that's important. So I'll talk about manufacturing because manufacturers need to remind themselves how important they are to the economy. Manufacturers employ 607,000 people in this state. That's a huge number of people. We are the largest sector of the economy, making up about 18% of the economy by gross state product. The next sector of the economy is real estate, and that's only 12, about 12% of the economy, and that's driven by manufacturing property values with high wages, buying money, uh, buying property in local communities, and driving the economy in the state. Um, MMA represents about 1,800 companies across the state in every sector and every corner of the state. Um, our, our members include the iconic na names like Ford, GM, Stellantis, Dow, American Axle, Magna, Holsom, uh, BASF, Kellogg, all those names you know. But 85% of our members employ 100, 100 employees or less. They are in your, what your community looks like. A bunch of manufacturers employing about 100 people but driving the economies in those local communities. We are what you are. Um, but what that, so what that affords us, when you have uh, small manufacturers in every little corner of the state, we have a huge ge geopolitical footprint. So when we have an issue, we reach out to our manufacturers, we encourage them to talk to their legislators, and now we've probably talked to every legislator in the state. And that's a very powerful footprint, a very powerful uh, uh, tool um, for, to move manufacturing policy. So to give you some more context about MMA, let me talk about a few successes that have been definitive in, in MMA. First in, in tax policy is the elimination of the industrial personal property tax. 
That was a huge effort by, by MMA uh, that started in 2012, took effect in 2016, and to, since 2016, we have saved manufacturers, and only manufacturers, by the way, $5.2 billion. So if you ever think about your dues and, boy, was that $1,000 a lot or not, guess what? You're saving a lot more just on that act and, can, and will continue to save that by eliminating that uncompetitive tax um, uh, that, that, that only manufacturers pay. Um, so in, in economic development, one of the other great things we did in 2021, we drove a package of bills that delivered $3.5 billion in economic development uh, incentive dollars. And that's critical for the future of the state because here's what happened. Ford, we have three major auto companies in the state. We have Toyota, Toyota and others, but three, you know, the big three. The future of Ford went, was attracted away from Michigan to Tennessee and Kentucky as they built out for the new EV economy, which is coming. You can all have debates about that, but it's coming. Um, and Ford took $11 billion investment and 11,000 new employees and went to Tennessee and Kentucky, partly because Michigan was unarmed. Since 2011, you know, my re Republican credentials, right? You heard them. I bitch about Republicans. It's bitching about family. It's okay. Governor Snyder, for his own reasons, ended the greatest economic development program that you are all aware of, MEGA, that started back in 1995. And Jim McBride helped push that. Thank you, Jim. Um, but in 2011, he said, hey, we're just going to have a... Uh, a low tax, low base uh, economy that that's going to compete effectively for transformational investment. Turns out he was dead wrong. And I had a chance to meet with him soon after he was elected and told him about my perspective on economic development, how critical it is to compete with other states because other states ha want what we have. They want our industrial base. They want the high wages and the, uh, the number of employees that manufactured employees. And we had a little discussion. I, he won because he's governor. <laughs> um, but, then, but then Ford left. I, I, in that conversation, I told him, I don't know if it's next week, next month, or, or 10 years from now, one of, some major investment's going to leave, it's going to be attracted somewhere else. And he said, well, we'll take that risk. In, in almost 10, 10 years to the day I had that conversation, Ford took 11 billion and 11,000 jobs. And think about this, one third of the future of the auto industry went to Tennessee and Kentucky. That's staggering. We were about to lose the auto industry. So uh, with Republican support and with Democratic support, we helped push through $3.5 in new investment that attracted $16 billion in, in capital investment from, from battery, battery companies and the autos specifically, um, and 16,000 jobs. Now you all, you know, economic developers know not all of that has happened yet. The implementation of, of economic development takes time and they're market-driven factors. But that's what was promised, and that's what might happen uh, over time. Um, but we're very, very proud. That's one of the signature things that MMA has achieved. Um, in, other, in other things, in talent development, uh, going pro, I know I would hope every manufacturer in this room is taking advantage of going pro. This is a, a state fund made up of $55 million that goes directly to manufacturers so you can train your people how you want to train your people. This isn't go, my friends of the community college, no, no offense, have the community college train them and then hope it sort of matches what you want. The you, manufacturers get to decide. They are the customers of the system. They get to decide what kind of training happens, and we're very proud of that. That was, you know, started out about six or seven million dollars uh, a number of years ago. It was just sort of a boilerplate item. We built it into a statute and have been driving that that program uh, ever since. Fifty-five million dollars. Very proud. Um, and we did a trade with the governor. She pushed uh, Michigan Reconnect. Um, this was to get folks who are older than now, I think the threshold's 21 or 22, um, back into the system who haven't really quite found their traction. Um, and so she gets 65 million because she's governor, we got 55 million, but we're going to continue to grow that, that program. Um, one of the things we're very proud of is merit curriculum flexibility. Um, we, we've been working with, with the state curriculum to allow more pathways to more flexibility to take CTE. Literally in the school code, to take a CTE program, you need to, you, prior to our work, it's partly true still, a, a special sign signature of your parents and teachers and others to go off into CTE, and it's built in the special ed section of the code. It's literally built into the special ed section of the code. That's ridiculous. The, the curriculum ought to be both academic and CTE like a menu, and you choose your future. 
this should not be, I need a special exception to go off into career tech. The largest sector of the economy needs people with skills. We shouldn't make it hard to get there. So we've been very successful in, in creating flexibility so that you can, you can take a CTE path. Uh, prime schools. Uh, the SME Education Foundation uh, has a program where we're going to create a career tech programs back in high schools. Career tech programs have been largely wiped out in this state. I take some responsibility for that. The House Republicans during, and I don't mean to cast any blame by blaming myself, Jim, um, but House Republicans and, and Republicans in general were about four-year degrees, right? Four-year degrees are really important. You make more money on, on average, blah, 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 but it crippled the state. It, because we weren't creating career tech programs anymore. In fact, they, they died. So I've spent now the rest of my career trying to undo the stuff I was doing back in the 90s. Um, so, so we partnered with the SME Education Foundation to create prime schools that trains teachers, provides equipment, and, and, uh, and trains, and provides, oh, provides a curriculum, pardon me. Um, so you can you know, kind of ready, set, manufacturing or a training program, put them back into high schools. And we created 50 schools across the state by getting $12 million out of, out of the state government to help fund that. We're very proud of that. There are more prime schools in, in Michigan than any other state in the, in the, in the nation. We're very proud of that. Uh, we've recently pivoted to a new program called Ignite that basically does the same thing, but it, by, it's a, through a program that's funded by the Department of Defense. Um, and we're very proud of that. We've got a uh, a, a million dollars in the uh, budget last year. We're going to grow that this year and continue to create more uh, Ignite schools across the state. Um, and we're proud. Bill, Bill Rail got $500,000 to create uh, employer-led collaboratives around these prime schools. And in, in uh, you know the magic of, of education, that if you take the employers and embed them and connect them with, with schools and translate the foreign languages that you all speak different languages, but connect the employers to the schools, you can create a talent pipeline. And that's what we're, and Bill is doing uh, with the, the funding from the state. And we anticipate a lot more. All right, let's talk about the, the legislature. What's the status of the legislature? For the last two years, there has been a Democratic trifecta. That means a majority in the House, uh, a Democratic majority in the House, a Democratic majority in the Senate, and the governor. And we also have a Democratic Secretary of State, a Democratic Attorney General, and guess what? The, su the Supreme Court is kind of bent Democrat. Um, what has been the result? Uh, the, the, the re very progressive policies. The Democrats are progressive, they're pro-labor, they're pro-trial lawyer and they're anti-employer. And I had the, the, the word enemy, and Jim called it, should we really put the word enemy in there? Is that, is that, you know, it's a little controversial. Yes, it is. But here's what, what, what that means. So Sean Fain, head of the UAW, through all that strike stuff and, and, and uh, you know, his public rhetoric, he called the employer the enemy. He was empowered by the, the Democratic trifecta and the strength of the Democrats to call the employers the enemy. <coughs> That, that's terrible. That's terrible for Michigan. That's terrible for success of manufacturing and terrible for employees. So that's, that's the enemy, Jim. Don't, uh, Democrats aren't the enemy, necessarily. Representative Coots may have a different opinion. Um, but the policies of the Democrat trifecta had damaged Michigan's business uh, climate. And let me, let me talk about the th just three of them, the three most important things that have happened that have damaged Michigan's business climate. The first one is the right to work. Right out of the chute, they eliminated right to work. And in, in, in our view, that changed the competitive nature of Michigan and its reputation for, for transformational investment. A lot of foreign auto companies and, and other foreign companies will never li, uh, come to Michigan because of this reputation of unionism. You can have your own opinion about unionism, but forced unionism is a different deal than people voluntary, voluntarily becoming a part of a union. So if you see all the major transformational foreign investments over the last 25 years, they've all gone to southern states where there is right to work. That is, so the southern states are actually bigger in the aggregate than Michigan was as, as a manufacturing state. And that's, I think, very much tied to uh, the issue of right to work. Uh, the next, the second most important thing is something that passed at the end of last year, changing Michigan's energy system from a system that focuses on, on price and reliability, I mean, choosing the kind of sources for power, whether it's coal or natural gas or wind or solar or other source, 
always decide which source you're going to have that's most reliable and most cost effective. That principle was thrown out the window and the Democratic uh, majorities in both chambers drove the most progressive energy policy in the nation by saying carbon reduction is the primary goal. Forget about price, forget about reliability. We're going to an intermittent sources driven by uh, wind and solar in this state. And we are a large industrial state state that needs very strong baseload power. We need baseload power to run 24 hours a day to run our manufacturers, not just when the sun doesn't shine and wind doesn't blow. We have screwed up the economy of Michigan going forward because the price of power is going to go through the roof and reliability is going to suffer. All coal under this plan will be shut down by 2032. Consumers have shut down much of it. It will be done by 2026. Uh, Edison will be done by 2032. That is a, a, a big sacrifice in terms of our, our reliability and price. Years ago, this is probably 10 years ago, co the co price of coal was 4.5 cents a kilowatt hour. Wind was in the 11 to 12. Wind and solar, you know, they're still hovering around 9 or 10, but it's not 4.5. It's doubled to tripled the cost of power. You all know that. The manufacturers know that. And you, know, and you probably know it at home because your energy bills are going up. Um, but, but to take... Michigan's industrial economy and make it uh, based on an intermittent source is just terrible for the future and terrible for any company thinking about bringing a, a high demand kind of industry. If you think about the chip industry and data centers, huge energy demand. A single uh, data center might take 100 megawatts of power. Guess what? We don't have that much power to attract that kind of investment anymore because we don't have strong base load. It's, we're shrinking it. And they took, and the other thing, um, as we've increased wind and solar in this state, we've replaced it with natural gas, uh, which is great because natural gas you can kind of crank up and crank down with the in intermittency of, of the uh, of wind and solar. Uh, but now in this new package, they said, oh, you've got to have to add carbon capture on, which reduces the effectiveness. And I just said effectiveness means cost, right? So, so you increase the cost of natural gas by adding carbon capture. No longer are they worried about price or reliability. They're taking the, the strongest and most reliable source we have after coal and making it much more expensive. So train wreck of a policy. Um, the last one is something that MMA drove, and that was a policy that we passed in 2018 that said Michigan shouldn't have regulations that are in excess of, of federal regulations because most states follow federal regulations. We, if you go beyond federal regulations, we have more, we'll have more regulations here, and by more regulations, I mean more expensive to do business here. And the Democrats wanted the Senate Bill 14. Senate Bill 14, one of the 14th most important thing that they did was to eliminate that policy. No longer say, hey, we want to be competitive with other states. They eliminated that policy and say, we don't care about whether we're competitive or not. We want to be you know, heavily regulated, and, and uh, we don't care about the economy. So train wreck, train wreck of a policy. Um, so let me talk about some threats and opportunities in the legislature, things that we've held off now. So we are in, in a two-year legislative session. We're down to, after today, lame duck session. There's only 11 session days between now and the end of the year. So we've staved these off. But these things could happen in the next 11 session days between now and the, the end of the year. Um, very dangerous things. Uh, workers' compensation has been a, been a great, actually MMA was founded on creating the workers' compensation in the early 1900s, such that the state will provide the solution to an injured worker and make sure they get paid and, and create a stable system for manufacturers to pay for that, uh, that system, manufacturing and other employers. Um, Democrats want the attorney general and individuals to be able to sue on top of that system to dramatically increase the cost of the workers' comp system. Train wreck. Um, and I spoke to the Railroad Association. They said, you got to quit saying train wreck. So I'm, I, I apologize for that if there are railroad folks. Um, unemployment benefits. The weekly benefits currently are 362. There is a bill by Senator Cherry in the Senate right now to move it to 600. Almost a doubling of unemployment benefits. And he said to us with a straight face, we're only increasing benefits. We're not increasing costs. Yeah. Tr tried not to swear. Tried not to swear. Senator Chair is a delightful man, just to be clear. Um, but but uh, the, uh, very expensive. Um, the next two items are, are related to uh, earned sick time and paid leave, and I'll talk about those separately in a, mi in a minute. 
Um, but there's also a, po a, a proposal, earned sick time increased or mandated but based on a ballot proposal, 72 hours of sick time. Um, and I'll talk again more about those. But there's another bill out there. Senator Geis has a, a plan to add 15 weeks of sick time for almost any reason. You can just leave and take, take 15 weeks. We've stuffed that, but we're very nervous that that would come up again in, in, uh, uh, in lame duck. The administration, the, the Whitmer administration, um, did a study and said that will cost between $2.5 and $3.5 billion. Senator Geis still wants to do it. Uh, local control over wages. There's a, a proposal out there to, to allow local uh, boards and commissions to set labor policy, wages, work hours, et cetera. That would be a train wreck. Again, I'm going to use that train wreck a lot Well, because I have to speak to the railroad in a couple of weeks. I'm trying to get it out. Um, allowing local communities to set their own wage creates a patchwork. So any you know, multi-billion dollar company isn't going to come into Michigan knowing that, that local, any local community of seven people could change their ability to compete in the global economy. No way would they take that kind of risk. Um, so that's a very much a, a risk to the Michigan uh, business climate. Um, they also want to eliminate independent contractors. The, the Democratic majority believes everybody ought to be an employee of someone. And, but we know, and you all know, the world runs on independent contractors, and that would throw us completely out of whack of, for competitiveness across the nation. Uh, the next item is polluter pay. This is a, a great term the Democrats use. They put it in quotes. But, what, but we have one of the most successful brownfield redevelopment programs in the nation uh, because we've limited the amount of risk for those who are willing to invest in brownfield and transform them into useful property. And uh, Democrats want to say, nope, we got to get back to the failed policies of the 90s to say we got to clean up to the last molecule or don't clean up at all. You know what happens? No clean up at all. Train wreck. Um, they also, there's also a bill on uh, air. I'm going to go. I'll, I'll get going. These are fast. But um, there's just so many of them, and I get so angry about them. Um, air, air permit penalties generally go in the general fund so there's no connection between, you know, like the Barney Fife revenue for, you know, tickets for revenue. Um, Democrats want to take that stuff, uh, that money, that revenue, and give it to, to community activists to complain about manufacturers. They really want to do that. They want to be able to say, let's train people to complain about manufacturers. Um, we've stuffed that bill, um, but I'm nervous about it in, in lame duck. Uh, Consumer Protection Act Senator Singh out of, out of East Lansing uh, wants to allow the Consumer, Consumer Protection Act to override all of the regulations. So, so you have licenses for you know, barbers and mechanics and plumbers and all of these regulatory things. So if you, uh, a citizen has a problem with a, their, their plumber or barber, or then the state solves that, right, through their license process. They want to add on the Consumer Protection uh, Act uh, to override those to allow the Attorney General to bring her own suits that includes class action opportunities and treble damages. So, you know, that, you know I, I talk about barbers and plumbers. What it matters to manufacturers, think about pharmaceutical companies who rely on the gold standard that is the FDA. If, if the Attorney General can sue, uh, even though a company is meeting the standards of the FDA, the, the Attorney General can just sue, we'll have no drugs available here in Michigan. I mean, just a terrible, terrible thing for Michigan and, and its citizens. But Senator Singh uh, started introducing this back in 2014 when he was in the House, and he's very serious about it now, and the Democratic trifecta might want to do something in the last 11 days of session. So we have opportunities, not just all scary stuff. Economic development, we talk about it. It's a, it's a huge thing for MMA. We've been a driver on this for, for decades. Um, there, we need to make sure the SOAR package or make it in Michigan as they're trying to transform it. That Michigan has enough money to give to companies to attract them here, such that if they don't, we don't have that kind of fund, they will go somewhere else, reference back Ford and $11 billion. Um, there's also a, a program called uh, HIRE, which is basically the old mega tax, and tax uh, capture approach uh, that we're very supportive of. Uh, except that they're, they're requiring super high wages. I won't get into details. Uh, but but uh, the, our primary goal here is a research and development tax credit. And the manufacturing economy needs to evolve uh, by doing research and de development. We're one of 13 states that don't have an R&D tax credit. Hmm, why isn't Michigan getting in more investment than we are? Because it's, it's much more effective uh, to, to grow your business through research in some other state. So we've been driving and think we have agreement on an R&D tax credit um, and uh, that will be one of our top priorities. 
So there is a rumor about a, a, a huge transformational plant. I'm under a non-disclosure agreement, so I can't really talk about it, but it, I can talk about rumors that I've heard in the papers that there is a huge chip-based investment going near Flint. And between now and the end of the session, there will be a multi-billion dollar package to see if we can attract and close that deal. Um, I want to be yes on that from a manufacturer perspective, but I'm very nervous that it might crowd out our research and development idea. We, we've agreed early with the administration to put it, start it as $100 million, which isn't much for R&D. We need it to be about a billion, but we, we agreed to grow that over time. If there's a multi-billion thing that goes maybe to one company and crowds out the budget from, for decades, I have, it's going to be complicated. In the next 11 days, we're going to be very, very busy um, wrangling, wrangling that issue. Um, but the other opportunity we have is continued money for uh, talent and development. Um, Bill Rail, hopefully we're getting more, getting more grants, we'll be getting more money for uh, going pro, and we'll continue to drive that, that uh, primary barrier to competitiveness, and that is talent. So we're very optimistic that we can get some of that done. So let me talk about lame duck. Lame duck is called lame duck because there are a lot of legislators who, who aren't, won't be in office and aren't really accountable. They're, they're, they're lame ducks. They can vote however they want and voters can never control them. Um, there's some argument to say we should never have a lame duck because of that dynamic. Uh, but we have a lame duck that will be very, very dangerous because we have a democratic trifecta. There's tremendous effort to rebalance the power. Um, and such that if Republicans do take control in the, in the Michigan House, Michigan House is the only, only party up, Senate's up in two years, um, that the, you know, the Republicans, or de if Republicans win, Democrats may want to say, Let's, this is our last chance. This is our, our Gettysburg, our higher widening mark. This is our last chance to get our, our stuff done. Let's just get together as Democrats and move all this stuff. That'll be a very scary day. Or it could be that, that Republicans lose, Democrats maintain control, and they say, oh, let's, let's go slow, and we, can, we have two more years to move all this stuff. Or they may say, hey, we still have control. We, we were just endorsed by the, by the people. Let's, am I like hitting 16 buttons here? What's going on? Can you help? Because I just, I hit buttons. Um, but if, but if, yeah, if Democrats win, it's sort of a coin flip of whether they're going to move things or not. But I know there will be a debate on this large capital investment. Oh, no, I need two tech people. Oh, my word. Oh, I did it. I totally did it. You gave me a tool that did not work. I, I blame you and, yeah. Um, but, we're, but we're very nervous about lame duck, um, partly because of the magnitude of things that could happen. Uh, if, the, if the Democrat majority holds true. Uh, the one interesting dynamic about the, the House majority, Democratic majority in the House, they have one rep, Dylan Wegela from South, Southeast Michigan, uh, who was a former teacher, and he promised his kids, we, I will never vote for economic development stuff. And he hasn't. So the Democratic majority, they have a one-seat majority, true in both chambers. We have 56, 54 um, in, in the House. And if, they, if they, that Dylan Wegela won't vote for economic development, they need Republicans. And, and gives Republicans all sorts of, oh, bless your heart, thank you so much. Um, they, uh, they, they gives Republicans all sorts of leverage to get something, make, make it very difficult to move economic development stuff. And, and Republicans, bless their hearts, I, I am one bitching about the family, Republicans generally don't like economic development incentives. And so, you know, Representative Kuntz, we'll talk, talk later. Um, so let me move on to um, minimum wage. Or, excuse me, I think I skipped over. I did. I skipped over. Uh... Nope, I'm good. Sorry. Um, minimum wage. So the Attorney General um, made, t took an issue to the Supreme Court, ballot proposal, back, very quickly. Back in 2018, uh, One Fair Wage pushed a ballot proposal to increase the minimum wage and put an inflator on that. Um, there was some fight in the legislature. I'm shortening the story a lot. Uh, but recently, the Attorney General went to the uh, Supreme Court and said, hey, here's our proposal for what we understand the ballot polls to be in terms of future, future wages. MMA filed a, an amicus with the Supreme Court. The liberal Supreme Court ignored our input and, and uh, adopted the Attorney General's suggestion. So now, in 2028, we will have $14.97. MMA generally hasn't cared about minimum wage. Um, but now, when you get into almost $15 an hour as a minimum wage, 
we're starting to get concerned. So this, that will be a very dangerous thing for competitiveness in this state when, other, when the southern states can pay a lot less. Um, just just the, this here's what MMA had suggested in our amicus. We would have topped out in our interpretation of that ballot proposal at just $13.63. But that's, that's uh, $14.97 is law. Um, so let me talk about earned sick time. <coughs> Earned sick time was a ballot proposal run by Mothering Justice. In government, you should never have the word mothering in it. It's something fundamentally wrong with that. Mothering Justice drove the ballot proposal in 2018 to require 72 hours of, of paid sick, lot, sick leave. For many manufacturers, they already offer 72 hours. It doesn't really matter. But the details of that ballot proposal, and here's what's wrong with ballot proposals, you can't, you can't really change them. Luckily, the legislature did adopt them and attempted to amend it. They were, it was ruled unconstitutional by the Michigan, liberal, <laughs> Michigan Supreme Court. Um, and so now that act, uh, the ballot proposal language is going into effect February 21 of 2025. We are now pushing amendments to that bill um, to allow, to smooth the implementation and help both employers and employees with issues. Um, the first one is, is a the, the ballot proposal doesn't allow pooled benefits. Sick time and, and, and vacation time together allows a lot of flexibility for employees and administrative simplicity for employers. Um, employees like that. But the ballot proposal doesn't allow that. It requires separate pools. Employees are going to be angry about this thing where the mothering justice was trying to mother them and help them. They won't be happy. Um, the other issue is uh, there's no exemptions to the act. Every employer down to zero, you know, one employee is required to provide 72 hours. Uh, 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 and so we've, we, what we've asked here is the exempt under 50 employees. Um, let's exempt part-time workers, at least those who work for less than 20 hours a week. Um, let's exempt temporary workers and let's exempt independent contractors. Because the ballot proposal requires all of those to be covered by a paid sick leave, which is very expensive and very complicated. Uh, number three, the, the, it allows no call, no show. I think it says um, you, you could tell your employer you're not going to show up when it's practicable. When it's practicable. No one, I, no one knows what the heck that means. It, um, and we're calling for prior to the start of shift, unless you're in a coma or you know, in jail or something. It seems reasonable. You should be able to let us know ahead of time. Um, and the, the other thing, this is going to be a litigation nightmare. Uh, employees can, if there's an adverse action against their sick time, like someone comes, you know, two days after uh, said I was sick, and the employer goes, were you really sick? The employee can say, that's an adverse action. I'm going to bring a personal suit against you, and I'm going to have the legal standard of rebuttable presumption that I'm right. A rebuttable presumption that he's right. Thousand bucks a pop. Thousand bucks a pop. So we're trying to, no other state has that, by the way. That will be the only, even California doesn't have stuff like that. Um, so we're trying to eliminate that um, and, and, and uh, you know, remove that, that, that nightmare, as we call it. Um, and then the last one, uh, employees like it when uh, employers front load their, their benefits. So you have more flexibility early in the year be, be, uh, to take sick time, um, but the, the act doesn't allow that uh, front loading. So you have to build it over time. You work certain, I guess, 30 hours and one hour per 30 hours work, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we're trying to inject these smoothing uh, implementation issues and trying to get a bill. We hope a bill will be introduced. First day of session in the lame duck is on Thursday. And we hope we will have uh, a bill. It'll be likely introduced in the House. Um, but the liberal Senate is the problem. They, they probably won't move this. But this is, that's our goal, move that legislation. And Representative Kuntz, we'll look forward to your support. I know we have it. So what have we been doing on, on earned sick time? Um, we have a mechanism we call voter voice. Um, and for the manufacturers in the room, take your phone out and scan that. It will take you to a mechanism that sends an automatic letter to your legislator to say, please pass the earned sick time fix bill. Um, so we encourage you right now, take your phone, scan it. Um, but but that's, that's a way that we can uh, communicate with legislators directly. You, your vo I'm a really good lobbyist. I, I don't mind patting myself on the back. But your voices are way more important than mine because you're in the district. When Representative Coons hears from you, guess what? He's going to pay attention. So please uh, send your letter to your legislator. 
All right, let me talk about uh, politics real quick. Um, how do we get here? How do we get to this Democratic trifecta? Um, back when uh, Governor uh, Whitmer was running against Tudor Dixon, Governor Whitmer won by 469,870 votes, a 10.6 margin. That's a, a, a whopping. And in House elections, top of the ticket matters. So in that race, governor was top of the ticket. Um, there was also an abortion ballot proposal that won by a greater margin than the governor won that won by uh, you know, 583,000 votes. So two very important things that brought people out to the vote and drove, drove uh, down ticket uh, consequences. The result of that, nine House Democrats won, but they won by less than 2,500 votes. In fact, five of them won by less than 1,500 votes and three of them by less than 1,000 votes. That's a very slim margin. They got a one-seat majority, 56, 54 in the House, under that huge top-of-the-ticket blowout. And, and if you look at the map, I mean, red everywhere, um, but in, in urban centers where most of the, where our losses happened. So fast forward to this race. Top of the ticket is really the presidential race. This is uh, Harris Trump um, and, and Kennedy, you know, long story there. Um, but since August 1st, up until Thursday of last week, excuse me, Wednesday of last week, um, it's been a very tight race. It's getting even closer. We're at, we're at about you know, less than 1%. Uh, or, you know, it says about 1%, but anyway, it, it was hovering about 1.8%, 1.8%, and then it dropped down to 1%. And, and so what I say is that is a very tight race. That's within the margin of error, um, and that's very, very good for prospects down the ticket, and that means how good things for the House Republicans. House Republicans in most districts tend to outperform Trump, so when Trump is close, House Republicans do well. And when, you know, the, you're, you're, you only have to overcome 2,500 votes or less. Look, I mean, we win one seat and we're at 55-55. That stops the Democratic trifecta. If you win two seats, you got to, Republicans get to organize the committees and decide the agenda in, in the House. Very important. So we really need to win two seats. Um, but, but I think top of the ticket is driving that bus. The other top of the ticket item is uh, the uh, Roger Slotkin race. That's uh, Harris is up by three percent. It's kind of stayed that same gap. Um, so that, that's still close. If Republicans can win by more than three percent, to the extent that's a top of the ticket dynamic, Republican candidates in districts can win by more than three percent, or, or well, gain as much three percent uh, relative to their Democratic. It should they should do well. Um, so here are the nine, nine races, uh, the, the, nine, the nine Democrats that won by less than 25, ranked from small, you know, 660 votes, uh, Jamie Church's, Betsy Kofia in Traverse City, Nate Shannon in, in, uh, in Warren, Jim Hadsma, chair of the Labor Committee uh, in, in Battle Creek, and Joey Andrews over in, in uh, uh, the St. Joe. Quick story about Joey Andrews. He's on the Labor Committee. He's very outspoken. He's 20-something. He's a 20 no snot noser. And my lobbyist, David Wortham's, testified in that committee. They had a little controversial exchange during the committee. After the committee, Dave is in the, kind of in the aisle way talking to someone. Joey Andrews comes by and gives him an elbow on the way out. That's the most sophomoric thing I've ever seen in the legislature, and I've seen a lot of sophomoric things in the legislature. Joey Andrews got to go. Um, anyway, the only uh, two, two interesting ones, John Fitzgerald. You served with John Fitzgerald's father. He was floor leader, Republican floor leader, and he's got a Democratic son. He'd be rolling over in his grave. He passed away a number of years ago, sadly. Um, but anyway, he's running against Tommy Brand, uh, Brand Steakhouse in Grand Rapids. Uh, Tommy's got a great name recognition. That will be a very close race. Jen Hill, UP from Marquette, very liberal, drove the energy package. She's got to go. Um, here are the House Republicans that won by less than, well, 2,700 votes. There's six of them compared to nine in, in sort of the risk territory. Uh, Jamie, Jamie Tom, I mean, these are the incumbents, to be clear. Um, Jamie Thompson, Jim DeSena, Donnie Steele, Mark Tisdell, Tom Coons, and Kathy Schmaltz. We feel good about all of them. Kathy Schmaltz, I think, is, has some challenges down there, but I think she's doing well. We put a lot of resources, as a lot of other folks have, uh, in those races. So... Again, we need to gain seats, 
when I say, and when I'm talking about politics, I'm not talking sort of, um, you know, philosophical, religious politics. So I'm Republican, I'm Democrat. I'm talking about practical politics and its effect on, on manufacturing policy and our legislative agenda. That's what matters, our legislative agenda. So if, you're, if I'm offending you, I apologize. I'm not talking religion. I'm talking practical politics and the manufacturing agenda. Uh, but anyway, so if we, um, if Republicans win uh, a couple of seats, they need to defend so that you don't offset the losses but here. But I think we have, they have nine vulnerable seats. We have six. That simple math uh, bodes well. Um, so we have a number of candidates um, that I, I won't go through many of them, just a couple of them. Uh, Riley Linting, right against Jamie Church, is a, who's a... Uh, pro teacher, young young person from uh, Southwest Mich Southeast Michigan, uh, Riley Linting is a, is a young person just came into college, young Republican, um, very aggressive at the door. She's doing very well. Lisa Trombley is a uh, a, a veteran uh, uh, def defense contractor out of Virginia who's retiring in Traverse City. Um, she's running a very good campaign against a very liberal uh, uh, Betsy Kofia in Traverse City, my hometown. Uh, except Lisa Trombley recently made the mistake of not saying Northern Michigan in a debate, and she said Northern Virginia, which tended to last a little. That landed poorly, so not good. Uh, Kara Bonak uh, against Jen Hill in the UP, uh, uh, radio and weatherman. Um, but anyway, we've got, we've got and there's Tom, and Tommy Brand, some really good candidates that so we feel very good about challenging uh, the Democratic incumbents. Um, so let me talk about endorsements and what MMA has done in, in, in our efforts. Uh, MMA endorsed 70 candidates, 61 Republicans, 44 of them were incumbents, and 17 non-incumbents. You saw many of them on, on the list there. Um, and we, uh, we endorsed nine Democrats um, in very safe districts for which you know, we had no chance, but one of them is uh, Angela Whitwer, though some think she's, we, we, the, uh, she, she's vulnerable. We don't think she is. She's chair of appropriations. She's a friend of mine. She's been very good to us in terms of appropriation for talent stuff, we're supporting uh, Angela Whitworth. Um, in the Supreme Court, oh, excuse me. Oh, I did it now. There we did, I did it again. <laughs> lovely, lovely. Anyway, um, again, you give me tools that are just broken here. Um, but we encourage you to uh, get, if you haven't, let me, who's, who's already voted? Who has not already voted? That's a Republican room right there. You can tell <laughs> that's the Republican room. Let me remind you to vote in the Supreme Court race. It's very easy to not get down to the Supreme Court, court race, but this we have a very liberal court that is making law. They are not reading law, interpreting it through the rule of law. They make up what they think. And you think they saw that in the minimum wage stuff and in the earned sick time stuff. They made stuff up. We need strong people on the Supreme Court. We endorse Patrick O'Grady and Andrew Fink. So make sure you check those boxes. Um, but so, so in our endorsement process, we, this is our, our digital badge. Oh, hello. I need a techno person just to run my show for me. Um, but we sent this digital badge out to all of our endorsed candidates. So you, you know, put it on your brochures, put it on your websites, uh, that sort of thing. Um, but we also reached out to, to our our members and said, hey, here's our list of endorsements, and please talk to your employees. Employee, on political issues, employees listen to their employers. They, they follow them because their careers and their futures with their families are dependent on the business doing well. So we encourage our members to speak to their employees. They can, under the law, can only talk to administrative level and above decision-making folks, but communicate to your people. Take the list that we sent out, Put it on the board and, and tell people to think about that list. You can't tell them how to vote. All you can do is tell them what you, how you're going to vote and encourage them to, to engage in the process. Um, so that's taking advantage of our geopolitical footprint. So we encourage you to, even today, put that up on your wall. With that, I'll, I'll thank you um, for the opportunity to be here today. It's been an honor to be around uh, economic developers who are great champions for growth in the state and manufacturers who drive this economy and, and make families happy.